I have uh, read uh, your books and I have uh, been following the development in, in what you have been talking about over the years. And, uh, and uh, it seems to me that, that, this has also, uh, that this also is a position that very many others will uh, uh, buy into in many different ways. And still we have a, uh, a different development within the field of mental health. So uh, the question is, and, and there are very strong forces. Like you know, uh, our colleague, Peter Goetze, who has been very critical of uh, psychiatric drugs. He was just expelled from the board mm -hmm. of Cochrane. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's now a very big debate and a very big uh, because of that. But it seems that we are, in many perspective, up against very strong forces. So, uh, and, and I think we have to face this on very many different levels because when you work in, for instance, in Norwegian psychiatry, there is a certain framework that you have to work within. So, like when you, at the end here before, said that, well, we have to use force in psychiatry in certain uh, instances, I think this also has to do with with the, the construction of a system that when you know problems are presented, they are presented in a ways where it's very difficult to see other possibilities. But there might be a possibility to present things somewhat differently. And I also think that in some respect, there is a development in that direction within parts of the field, but parts of the field also moves in a very different direction. For instance, I think here in Norway now, there are two very strong, uh, what should I call it, position that's, that's, uh, that has got political support in a way. And one, the one position is, you know, uh, that we have to develop the patient's healthcare system. The, this healthcare system is not for the professionals, like many professionals have seemed to think, but it's for the patients. So we shouldn't do anything without talking to the patients. And the patients should, you know, give the premises for what is good practice, also in the field of psychiatry. So we have to listen to the, to the um, consumers or the patients or, or whatever people want to be called. Uh, and I think the reason we have got this drug-free drive in Norway is the consumers. It has nothing to do with the professionals. The professionals, uh, at least many, think, seems to think that this is, this is uh, uh, practice without the knowledge base, like one of the professors said in the, in the medical journal. Or, it's, uh, the, or the health minister is ir irresponsible. He's not listening to the professionals. He's listening to someone else that he shouldn't listen to. So this is, a, this is one drive in this country. And the other direction is a very medical drive. And I think uh, the, we are now, uh, in, in Norway now, uh, so-called treatment packages, or packages both for evaluation and treatment of psychiatric illnesses or diseases is being introduced. And to get help in mental health care in the future, you will have to buy into treatment packages. And I think this is, uh, this is driving, uh, driving the field in a very medical direction because uh, the goal of the treatment package, the first one will be introduced 1st of January next year, and the first one is an evaluation package. And when you apply this package, you will have to uh, translate the patient's problems into medical terms. And the patient will have to buy into this. If the patient doesn't buy into the medical description of his problems or her problems, then he will not be able to get help. So you this need is like managed care in, in the US. One way, yes, in one yeah, way. Yeah. It, you have to so you have agree to have that diagnosis. you have to have a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. As if the diagnosis was, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, showing some kind of disease in yeah, a way. And yeah. we all know that the diagnosis in psychiatry is just a classificatory mm -hmm. system. It doesn't really, it doesn't really uh, show a disease, although there was an idea or when it was introduced, the current version back in, in, in 1980, that there is some underlying uh, malfunction in the individual that manifests itself with symptoms, so, and, then, and that we eventually, by 
treating clusters of symptoms as diseases, we will find the underlying malfunctioning disease. And we're still looking for it. We've been, when I started in, in mental health in 1974, I heard that, you know, uh, there's going on a lot of research on the, on the central nervous system, and we just, it's just a short time now, and we'll find the answer. And you still hear the same thing. It's just, you know, it's, we're right on the threshold of finding the answer for mental health problems uh, by, you know, brain research. So I think these two different drives in Norwegian psychiatry, at least, I don't know how international they are, but at least in Norway, this is very central. And I think that uh, we, in one way, will have to decide, because it's not possible, in my opinion, it's not possible to to ride these two horses at the same time. We have to decide which way to go. And I think there's Norwegian psychiatrist, Trond Eure, he's written a very nice book uh, this year that's called uh, a, less, um, a Less Medical Psychiatry, Minder Medicinsk Psychiatry, Den vi anbefaler. It's something along these lines he also writes. Maybe not completely similar, but something along that. And, uh, so I think, so these were just some of the thoughts I had after after your presentation. Yeah, no, that's really interesting to hear about the situation here. Um, so we have the same the same sorts of movements, although in different in different terms in the UK. And what I would say the main limitations are there are the economic um, resource constraints, which means that. Uh, people are only being admitted to hospital for very short periods of time. And in order to do that uh, and to get them out of hospital quickly, they're obviously being heavily medicated. Um, so that, to me, makes it very difficult to uh, take anyone's wishes into consideration um, or to try and practice in a more humanistic, um, patient-focused way. Um, it certainly makes it impossible for anyone to be able to recover from a condition naturally without, without having a considerable amount of drug treatment. And then the other thing that happens is people get discharged into the community on high levels of medication, um, and then that medication doesn't get, you know, they just get left on it. It doesn't get reviewed mm. regularly or adjusted. Um, so... So, I, so, so to me, that's that, that's one of the major constraints that's happening in the UK at the moment. Um, we we have a patient movement, obviously a service user movement, but it, it has different arms. So there are some people within that movement who like you know like the idea of diagnosis and and treatment and uh, um, you know, have have interests that are aligned to some extent with with biological psychiatrists and pharma, um, and then there are other people within that movement who've been advocating for soteria type facilities. Mm. You know, drug which, which essentially is drug free treatment um, type facilities. So there are different elements, but it, it maybe isn't quite so obviously divided as you describe it here. Mm. Um. Well, maybe that's only my perception, but my perception is that it's that that there are different mm, directions mm. at the same time. Yeah, no, I'm sure that's true. And and it seems also that that uh, uh, I mean it's it's difficult to understand why this enormous amount of uh, psychiatry critical literature is not making more of an impression. When you listen to Aina, for example, how many how many books do you sell? Uh, not much. No, that's why we have actually, we're giving it away free. Yeah, because so reach more uh, readers. So so what what can we do to really raise the debate? I mean, it's uh, it's amazing to me that this book that I mentioned by Trulnoyre that it hasn't raised the debate in Norway. Mm. You hardly mm. see any, mm. anyone commenting on it. So it's uh, it's something that's it's uh, it's difficult to see how how it's possible to move forward in one way in this yeah. situation. But at the same time, you can see, uh, you have the possibility, of course, in your own practical field, there's the possibility. When I meet one patient, 
I have the possibility to say that this drug here, it might help you to get rid of some of these symptoms, but it might also change your brain uh, in a permanent way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, so, uh, so maybe that would be one direction to go into, say that we should have more clear uh, ideas about what kind of information we should give to patients when it comes to drugs. Yes, yes, I think that's, that's a good point. So maybe that, but yeah. that could be one thing to yeah. do to create yeah. more uh, to create more uh, information about the different effects of drugs, uh, the way the, the drugs work on uh, on the body. Yeah, I've, I've wanted to create some sort of drug-centered leaflets about different different medications for a while. Um, uh, in, yeah, in order to present present them in the sort of way that you're saying. I think that would but be you a good thing to that. do. Not, no, oh. no, I haven't really got round to it. You've almost <laughs> done it with a little. Uh, I've with done a book. it in book forms. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I suppose so. But not as you know. I think it would yeah. be useful to have leaflets too. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I do think from my experience in the UK uh, that all that pharma publicity in the 1990s really did start to sort of get under people's skin, and and um, you know the health service is overwhelmed by people who are experiencing social hardship, you know, who are about to lose their home um, or their job or, you know, their children's involved with street gangs or, you know, they've got all sorts of reasons to be really depressed and stressed and unhappy. Um, and we have been telling, you know, the psychiatric profession and the pharmaceutical industry have been telling them for years and years that they should think of this as a disease and go and see their doctor. And I... I think that message has got through so strongly. It's we need to reverse that yeah. Um, yeah. because I think that's just such an unhelpful way for you know. It, it, well, it's just not it's not true that the doctor has any answers. That's mm. that's the main that's the main um, problem with that that yeah. situation. Mm. Would you? Okay, we have some questions from uh, from the audience. So if you are ready for it. Here comes the first one. My friend, 58 years, is today in a mental ward with forced medication with antipsychotic drugs. He started uh, that when he was 28 years. After 25 years on these pills, he wanted to get off. He has tried five to six times, but he doesn't make it. He gets very ill. Is he addicted to these pills? Or why can't he get off? So, um, so that's a not uncommon situation. I don't know who who asked that question. I don't know if you want. To. Hi, <laughs> so that's a not uncommon situation. Um, and there are many reasons why this person might not be why your friend might may not be able to get off the drugs. So. Uh, so one possibility, I was talking to someone earlier, um, is that the medication has permanently changed his brain and therefore every time he tries to come off um, all the, um, uh, the, 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 the he, he will have grown, for example, more dopamine receptors if he's on antipsychotic drugs and probably lots of other receptors that have been suppressed as well. And so when he reduces the medication, they start all firing off and that may precipitate you know, another psychotic episode. So that is a possibility. Um, but it is possible as well that they are suppressing something that is continuously there, and when you take the lid off, it, it comes out again. Um, you know, I think I, I've been looking through the records of my local mental hospital recently, and they said uh, um, from 100 years ago, it's difficult to know what was going on for people then, obviously, but it does suggest that there were some people who did seem to get into a permanent sort of psychotic state and didn't come out of it. Um, so, so, so uh, you know, so I think both of those things are possible and it's, it's difficult to tell. And I presume he's tried to do this, you know, slowly and gradually because obviously that's the main thing. I was also saying to someone earlier that, um, you know, I... I I have come to the conclusion that I think in some cases they do alter the brain permanently and therefore actually 
trying to get off them completely if you've been on them for a long time may just not be possible for some people. And it may be, poss may be better to aim to get to a low dose um, and, and stick at that, and maybe that could be reduced even further um, than trying to come off them altogether. Sometimes that, you know, that, that, uh, certainly that's worked for some, some of my patients. I would also th yes, think please, that, yeah. uh, that, uh, that there's a lot of evidence that you become more psychosis prone from using drugs. And also when it comes to tapering down or, or withdrawing from uh, psychotropic drugs, there's not very much science. I mean, uh, the field has not been very occupied with finding out how to do this in a good and safe way. Because when we now have tr tried uh, to develop uh, drug-free treatment programs, we have tried to mm. check the literature on this, and, and we don't find any, uh, except some things that's been developed by people that have used the drugs themselves. So there are quite a lot of experiences from people that have used the drugs, but not the kind of scientific evidence that you often look for in medicine. So uh, it's, I think it's important to see if it's possible to get more scientific evidence of, of how to safely uh, get off psychotropic drugs, mm -hmm. drugs and especially neuroleptics. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I think uh, uh, we all be, it's not only getting off the drugs, that, but it's also are there things that you should or should not or could or could not do instead? Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, it's difficult to take other things the same way through your mouth that you take drugs. I mean, you can't prescribe things in medicine uh, the same way that you prescribe drugs. There's something with prescribing drugs that's very, that's very medical, so to speak. So, it's, so what can you do instead? Uh, I mean, you say that if you work, for instance, recovery-oriented, could that be some, should that, how could that be done in a tapering down situation in the best way? So there are very many sides to this. And also, uh, there are drugs, they are, uh, they are not made for tapering down. They're made, they're, they're, you know, they're capsules, or they're, you have to use a hammer to, to get a smaller piece if you want to gradually reduce. So it's, it's not very easy to, to find good ways to do this. And it seems also that, that it's very individual how people react when they try to taper down. So that's at least the experience that we have done with the drug-free treatment unit is, you know, like, it's like when you go from four milligrams to three milligrams, Haldol, something happens if, that hap if you do that in just half a year. You have to do it in one year. Then maybe it's possible in a different way. Mm. Yes, thank you, both of you. I think uh, the next question is related to the first one, actually. Uh, because, as you say, this is the kind of knowledge that the pharmaceutical industry is not very interested in exploring. And here comes the next question. Are there examples of screening of brains of people before and after treatment with neuroleptics? That's a quite fascinating question, I think. Um, I don't know why any certain... No, I don't think so. There, there are... There are some um, th there are some screen uh, some MRI studies on people who haven't taken neuroleptics, um, uh, which have which have shown some differences, some slightly smaller brains in people who then um, who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia than people who don't um, before they've taken drug treatment, um, and slightly bigger brain cavities. I think there are, but there are many confounding factors that probably haven't been controlled well in those studies, like um, IQ, uh, class, exercise, you know, all sorts, sorts of other things that may influence brain size. But I don't know any that have sort of done, done a study just before someone started taking them and then followed them up after they've taken them. Okay, Moinus, do you have any comments <laughs> no. on that? No. Okay, so now we jump to another theme. What do you think about uh, the recent re-emergence 
of research on the use of psychedelics in the treatment of mental disorders. Uh, that's an interesting, interesting question. So we've had some, um, there's a lot of interest in the UK and we've had some debate within the Critical Psychiatry Network about it. Um, and uh, so my feeling is, as I said about when I mentioned the Gary Greenberg book, that, uh, that it is possible sometimes for people to have drug-induced experiences and to learn from them. Um, but uh, but I'm not, not sure that that translates easily into a form of therapy. Um, so so one, of the, one of the ideas, one of the sort of types of research is involves giving people psychedelic drugs and then doing psychotherapy with them. Um, I suppose the, the idea is the psychedelic sort of provokes... Um, uh, memories and sort of breaks down inhibitions a bit. So, I, I mean, I suppose my feeling about that is some people might find that useful. It wouldn't be for me. <laughs> but, you know, there might be some people who might find that idea, you know, helpful. But I think it's very important that it's acknowledged for what it is. It, some of the research that's being done in the UK is being done in a quite a disease-centred sort of framework. So the idea is you know, that uh, LSD works on serotonin, maybe therefore, because they're still assuming that serotonin is involved in depression, maybe therefore it's going to, um, you know, reverse the depression, and that, I think, is, is, is not helpful. Probably, I mean, uh, all psychoactive substances, you could think about that it's possible to use them in a meaningful way, uh, but... Uh, but uh, I think often there are also other possibilities. For instance, in this case, meditation seems to be mm -hmm. something that can indu induce the same, uh, what, what you call it, status as, a, as some of these drugs. It seems like. At least that's what is being described in literature. Mm -hmm. Yes. O okay, here comes a quite different uh, question if I manage to get it right, given the significance attributed to RCTS, also these randomised and controlled studies, uh, which all target what is defined as the effect of a chemical, and given the arbitrariness of the distinction between effect and side effects, how can such studies still be defendable, acceptable? Um, I'm not sure that I totally understand the question. So, does, does whoever asked it want to want to express it? Yes. Yes. Um, when, when, you, when you think of the interaction of a drug and a body, mm. you all the time keep the illusion that there is one thing which we call the effect. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The yeah. The yeah. rest is what we don't want. Yeah. Yeah. Our side effects. Yes. So I, I've thought about this a lot. I think that's a really good point. Um, but I'm not sure that I would agree with you. Okay, so if you wanted to see whether a dose of Valium sent you to sleep or um, sent you to sleep faster or calmed down someone who was, you know, running around a ward smashing windows or something, I, I think that is something you could measure in an RCT um, it, it's always going to be a bit crude because you have to decide. Do you know what? One early randomized control trial of antipsychotics, their outcome measure was how many windows were smashed. That was actually their outcome. So I, I think you, and it's fairly easy to measure <coughs> sleep latency, how long it takes you to get to sleep. So I think there are some things that you can, you know, some measurable effects of, of drugs that you can measure. They're not necessarily... I mean, I mean, your point about whether it's a therapeutic or a side effect is uh, completely accept that. Um, 
you know, the therapeutic effect is just the effect we want or we like. We've just selected that out arbitrarily from, um, from the global effects of a drug. And it may be, uh, you know, that we like that, but all, you know, the other things that the drug are doing actually outweigh any benefits it might have. That's, you know, you might find you get to sleep earlier on your Valium, but actually, you know, you can't get out, up for hours the next morning. So actually, it's not much use. But I still think that we could te there are some things we could test out in a, a, a in a trial. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. No, that, yeah. sorry, that's a really good point, yes. So we're looking at, we need to look at the global effects of drugs. Absolutely, I agree with you. And yeah. complexity. And, and complexity and duration, that, you know, doing studies that, that last for years and years and years, you know, because in theory, you might give someone one dose of drug and something might still happen five years down the line, even if they're not you know, don't take it again. So really, you want long-term follow-up for everything. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. That's why I, I, um, I wonder how long will this so last until we have dismantled the illusion of the solidity of the RCTs, because <coughs> they are a complete illusion. If you put it into an equation, there is only one factor which you are interested in. The 17 others yeah. have also changed, because yeah, nothing yeah. is unchanged. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fragile, the whole system. Yeah. I wonder, how long can it last? So, I mean, I think one of the reasons we are, as you say, hung up on randomised control trials is that we, uh, as a society, but, you know, doctors are particularly guilty, do have a rose-tinted view of the effects of our drugs. We, want, we don't really want to hear the bad news. Um, so we focus on short-term studies that you know, look at a relatively narrow range of effects so we can say, oh, look at this. And then we pay much less attention to all the bad things that happen down the line. And occasionally these come out and there are big scandals and things are taken off the market, uh, you know, that because there is post-drug marketing. Um, it's not very systematic. No one really bothers to pay for it. But there is a certain amount, you know, a certain amount of it does go on. Um, so, yes, it's, it's really about we need to tip the balance back, don't we? We, we, you know, my view is, you know, a drug is harmful until proven otherwise, really. Um, except that, having said that, there may be some situations that are, you know, so devastating in themselves, you might be prepared to put up with that uncertainty. But nevertheless, that's, that's the principle that we should be going by. And we need to put a lot more attention into working out what, long-term effects these drugs are having, yeah. Not only is this not solid enough, it's even unethical. Yes, yes. And if we don't tolerate that as a profession, I'm in a profession, then we should try to find something else to do. I mean, nobody is forced to be in medicine. And nobody is forced to defend this system. If it's too uncomfortable, we take the consequences. I think that was good. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's yep. a good point. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, you know, as a psychiatrist, there are many times when I feel very uncomfortable about uh, my work. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, it relates to a point that Magnus was making earlier. Um, you know, it, it's very difficult often, and you would probably relate to, to work... In a, in a system that is sort of geared up towards medicating people and keeping people quiet in, way, in different ways because everyone around you is, you know, has a sort of different agenda. Um, so you do the little things that you can, but often it doesn't feel like very much. Yeah. 
Well, okay, <laughs> I think you need a <laughs> microphone if you're going to say more because not everyone can hear you. Sorry. Okay, so if there are more comments from the audience, we will have the microphone out. Sorry. Okay, here comes a double question. What is the best treatment for depression and what is the best treatment for trauma? Do you want to have a go? I feel like yeah, I've been talking well, a lot. I you, think you it's, you uh, first. it's in one way uh, a <laughs> very difficult question because you have to then address what, what is meant by depression here mm. and what is meant by trauma here. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's. Yeah. I mean, because if you if you look at people that have been traumatized, uh, for instance, people that have been seriously seriously traumatized in early childhood, uh, they will generally have a, a much bigger risk of being diagnosed with different kind of psychiatric problems later in life. Uh, so that might then lead to different con uh, answers to a question: What is a good treatment? Uh, and also, when it comes to to depression, what when you talked about depression, I mean, in in the 1930s, one percent of the population was depressed, and the depression at that time tended to go over by itself unless you died from it, uh, which also m might happen. But I mean, generally, it would it would end. Today, I mean, over the lifetime, 20 percent will be depressed. Uh, and so that must be a different kind of depression. So which depression do we treat here? Um, it's difficult to say. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's also so, and it, and it also, <coughs> uh, the point that I made, I think I made earlier, that uh, we, the diagnosis, they kind of, uh, they're very well shaped to, to make uh, research on treatment programs. So there has been a lot, of, made a lot of research on treatment of depression with, uh, with different kind of behavioral treatments. And some of them proved better than other treatments, which might actually be a result of very many different things. So it's not, it's not uh, uh, so therefore I cannot say that, you know, cognitive behavioral treatment, well, that's the treatment of choice with uh, with uh, depression, although many people would say that. So that would be you know, one kind of simple answer. So I would say you would have to, have to find out what kind of trouble is a person in, and then you would have to uh, talk with the person about what kind of help the person would think that he or she needs, and then you would have to find out. It's, in one way, being there with someone is the, is, you know, the important thing of... Uh, treating the majority of what today is called depression. So, so I would agree, and also go back to something Professor Eckland said earlier, that um, uh, it's not about treating depression as a thing. Depression isn't a thing in its own right. There are people who have depression or who are depressed, and, and depression is a, is a human emotion. It's a human response to the world. So everyone who is depressed will be depressed for different reasons, in different circumstances, and in different ways. So it's about, if you, and, and as Magnus points out, it is self-limiting. People don't, very rarely anyway, stay depressed for a long time. It's a response to something, to some set of events. So, so from my point of view, what's important if you're trying to help someone with depression is to identify what particular set of events are, have precipitated and are sustaining their, their depression and to try and sort them out. And that, that's going to be different for each different person. And for some people, having some therapy of some sort might help them to identify that or to identify you know, better coping mechanisms for coping with with. Um, some stresses that they're under, but for other people, it will be, you know, addressing other other roots, other other uh, things that have precipitated their their emotions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think um, the concept of alcoholism is relevant here to to what you say. I, I worked in that field for many years, and I had people coming to me saying, "I'm an alcoholic. Please treat me," and my response would be. Well, 
What, what is your alcoholism like? How, what is your life situation? What do you use alcohol for, etc.? And then we could start talking. People telling me that they were alcoholic didn't really give any meaning. <laughs> okay, we have uh, one more question here about Ritalin. Um, how is it possible to give this drug to people, particularly to young people, because when the effect fades, you get uh, withdrawal symptoms, and they will be interpreted as if you have ADHD or something like that, and then you need to take more medicine. How about that? So yeah, Ritalin, so mm. a question about yeah. Ritalin and ADHD, another one. Um, so, so I said earlier that Ritalin and stimulants generally can be shown in animals and in volunteers to help people quieten down and focus in the short term. But I'm glad I've had an opportunity to say that, um, that long-term studies don't suggest that that translates into any benefits in terms of, um, in terms of sort of higher school performance or achievement or you know, any advantages in terms of, of life attainment. Um, so, so uh, quite possibly the effects wear off or, or maybe the attention you get under the influence of stimulants isn't, isn't quite the attention that you need. Um, uh, there are various possibilities. Uh, and what was the question was about? Um, does anyone want to identify themselves as the questioner? <laughs> The question was also about, wasn't it, about whether, um, whether whether children get withdrawal effects? So yes, they do, don't they? The the um, the effects of Ritalin are quite short acting, so uh, so that the child will become calmer, and then as the effects of Ritalin wear off, they'll they'll become hyperactive again, which may be interpreted as uh, um, you know as increasing severity and need, needing higher doses. Mm. Um, and and the and. One of the most interesting long-term studies which compared Ritalin and cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, was, was reported as showing benefits of stimulants um, can equally be interpreted as showing that actually the cognitive behavioral therapy was as effective in helping children to, to manage um, symptoms and more effective probably in the long term. If you wanted to yeah, add anything, yeah. I think um, I think I think thinking about giving medication to children really highlights the symbolic issues around medication. Um, so I really worry that if a child learns that ch that be that al adults don't like the way it's behaving and it needs to take a drug to please people that that might be, you know, that that's not a good life lesson to be teaching children and might translate into, you know, into sort of more maladaptive coping mechanisms as, as children get older. Yes, thank you. And um, I think uh, we are getting closer to winding up for today. Uh, People are getting a little tired, and uh, it has been some intensive hours. So I would like to thank you very much, all of you, to Johan, Magnus, and Joanne in particular, coming all the way from England. And thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you. <laughs>